It is Sunday morning, and you are here with us at First Parish. The consequences of this enforced isolation are that sometimes it's hard to find sleep or to make sense of a world that is so full of things that all feel wrong. Mourning Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg and picking up where she put her work down reflecting on the passing of summer, or perhaps heartened by the beauty of the changing of the leaves. Maybe you're struggling with a child in school or celebrating life events from a distance. With all of this going on, it is especially important to connect consciously and intentionally with each other, to experience one another's presence and to be present for one another. It's a form of self-care and a form of community care. And being together is something we do well here. It is well that we have come here together today. Be present with us and thank you for joining us. Now, just two quick announcements. Today at 1 p.m., Join Reverend Erica and Tina for family worship. They will offer a blessing of backpacks, devices, and masks for all children and youth embarking on educational adventures. The long Zoom link uh, has been shortened to tinyurl.com slash FPUU bless kids to make it a little easier to remember. You'll see it in the chat. The coming of age begins tonight at 7, and the programming for younger children starts next Sunday. Next up, our blood drives will resume their regular schedule at First Parish Unitarian Universalist in Arlington, Mass. at 6.30 Mass Ave. Starting Saturday, October 3rd, with donor appointments available from 8 a.m. to 2 p.m. Blood donors are needed now more than ever. Please make an appointment with the ARC Blood Donor app, the application on your phone, or at redcrossblood.org, or by calling 1-800-RED-CROSS. Volunteers should reach out in advance to John Hodges directly uh, at blooddrives at firstparish.info. So there's basically four ways you can, can work on this. And now we would like to celebrate and honor the service of Joan Dyer and welcome Sarah Hidalgo. Marta? Good morning. I am Marta Flanagan, one of the ministers here at First Parish. And it is a privilege that today I get to help honor Joan Dyer. Joan Dyer. You are retiring. You began heading up all the administrative work in the office at First Parish in the fall of 2009. You have hired staff, reconfigured staffing positions. You have managed our rentals, including two nursery schools, choirs, and an orchestra. You have managed our IT, and until we contracted with a bookkeeper, you did bookkeeping on the side as well. You have been the one who saw that things got fixed, from the photocopier to the toilet. You've gotten keys made and spreadsheets created. You've ordered green paper supplies and of late hand sanitizer. You have kept your eye on changing issues of church insurance, taxes, and benefits. In your 11 years with us, you have managed staff transitions and most impressive building transitions. None of us who were here then can forget the renovations of the meeting house meant that we were office-less and classroom-less for most of a program year. You made your way around cons a construction site and kept us all calm. With no disrespect to any of the other staff, I believe that you have held the hardest job at First Parish. You are often the person people turn to first for assistance, and they usually want what they want right away. But most dear to me, Joan, was always how you met those who were hurting. 
the person looking for an NA meeting, the homeless person who walked in mumbling and hungry, or the woman fresh with hard medical news looking to talk to a minister. Joan, during these 11 years, I have relied on you. You have laughed with me, and there have been moments we have each cried. Both of us lost our mothers during these 11 years. And now you are moving on to another season in your life. I will miss you. I am happy for you. To celebrate your service, I turn now to Sarah Galantowitz, Vice Chair of our elected parish committee. Good morning. Joan, on behalf of the parish committee, and in fact, the whole first parish community, we wanted to take this opportunity to thank you for everything you've done and acknowledge your tremendous gifts and service to first parish. Your knowledge of our people, of our processes, and of our building is absolutely legion. I think you have probably forgotten more about our home at the corner of Mass Ave and Pleasant Street than I will ever know. Your ability to keep us running smoothly, usually behind the scenes, is a true gift, as is your compassion and your wisdom. And what we'd like to do now, John and I, is to share a sample of voices of thoughts from other members on behalf of the First Parish community of what you've meant to all of us. Joan, thank you so much for all you have done for us over the years. We will definitely miss your sure hand on the tiller. Thank you for all the times I dropped by your office and we had a spontaneous chat. Thanks also for your good advice in directing me to the right people to handle things. You are a wealth of knowledge. Fearless, irreverent at times, sparked with humor and deep caring, you are an integral part of the community we work to build. We will survive your transit, but not easily. Thank you, Joan, for spending these years with us. We are saner, more whole, and able to move on because of what you have given us. Whether it's responding to a simple question or plunging into a complex problem, you and your can-do self are always richly pleasant present. It's not just that you seem able to come up with solutions to almost any question I've ever had, it is that you do it with such a long, you are magic yes energy. My image is of you jumping up from your chair, striding into the hall and leading me off to the solution of whatever problem I have posed and at the end of the narrated journey to the question is answered, the problem is solved, and I feel better about everything in general. Many the day we have had problems with Realm or other areas of First Parish's website, Joan has always been tireless, gracious, and generous in helping us solve problems and learn how to navigate the world of First Parish. We are grateful. Please let Joan know how much I appreciate her and enjoyed working with her. I loved being able to stop by and chat with her. I loved how well she took care of us and how fabulously human she is. You were so helpful to me whenever we had financial questions and event dates to work out. Please know that your assistance, sense of humor, and knowledge of how to navigate Firth Parish could not be more appreciated by a newcomer. So Joan, we wish you well, the whole community, on your well-deserved retirement and we'll be sharing a more tangible token of our appreciation will arrive at your house in the next couple of days. But please, share, please uh, accept our very deep thank you for everything that you've done. Thank you. You're gonna make me all, you're all gonna make me cry. <laughs> uh, you know, Marta said it all. I mean, I've been there since just a few weeks after Marta started in 2009 and you guys have you know, I have, it's just been a wonder to watch this congregation you know, go through the years and the changes and the things. I, I think back, and as Marta said, the, the first really big thing, you guys raised a 1.7 million and did this huge renovation. Um, yeah, that was huge for everybody, including, uh, you know, the, 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 it, it was fun in many ways to, to, you know, adapt. That's always been my thing. Um, you know, and, and then you've done even more into social action and turning outward, you know, since then. And, and recently, I, you know, the, the another big change, you, you dug deep and found ways so that you could, you could fill your need for a 
having a second minister and you've hired a, a I think Eric is going to be fabulous. I, 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 I wish I was in some ways I, I'm glad I'm retiring, but I'm in some ways I, I, you know, if there's things I'm going to miss, I'd be like to see how that, how that comes. And um, anyway, so um, uh, it's been, you have a fantastic staff team. The, the highlight of all of my years working here has always been working with my colleagues. Uh, it's, you know, it's, it's, been the thing that holds it holds us all together. We hold each other up. Um, I'm I I'm looking forward to uh, spending some more time with uh, my husband, who's been retired retired for a couple of years, and a few things. You know, even in this COVID time, maybe a little bit of this and a little bit of that. But I just thank you for all these years, and I I can't actually believe that. And I'm going to stop coming to work. So thanks. Joan, I don't know if I'm on. Joan, Joan, among the gifts oh, that you will receive, um, that Sarah will be bringing over to your home, are two from me. The first is a gift certificate to help launch you in the craft projects uh, you hope to take up in retirement. And the other gift is one engraved with these words. Joan Dyer, resourceful, and wise, perceptive, and kind, partner in ministry, 2009 to 2020. Joan, you have been a partner in ministry with me. Thank you, and Godspeed. And for those wondering who could possibly replace Joan, Sarah Hildalgo is here. With much thanks to Paul Hollings and Maggie Carey as well, we joined, joined together, we hired Sarah Hildalgo as our new office administrator. Behind the scenes, Joan has been training Sarah Hildalgo. I note that Sarah Hildalgo comes to us with much experience, including her most recent position as, as administrator at First Parish in Lexington. I also note that Sarah DeLong is continuing as our halftime office associate. With gratitude, we can say we have been in good hands and we are in good hands. What a blessing. Let us now engage in a song that speaks of our past and of our hopes as a liberal religious people. Our hymn is, It Sounds Along the Ages.
We gather as we do every Sunday morning, be it in a sanctuary or online. We gather as a people of memory and of hope. We think of the week past, the orange skies of fire in the west, the rising waters of the south, and the life of an unlikely and wonderfully notorious woman. We think of the numbers of a pandemic, of the unemployed, and of the polls. We think of the days growing cooler and shorter, pumpkins and apples ripe for the picking. We are approaching the autumn equinox. We are in the midst of the Jewish New Year. This is a time of hardships. This is a season with its own sweetness. We light a flame to remind us that amidst even hardship and loss, light shines. We are in the midst of the Jewish holidays of the new year. Later in our service, we will hear the shofar call us to awake. We are approaching the autumn equinox on Tuesday, and later in our service, we will call the directions, awakening us to the natural world all about us. But first, we name what holds and guides us as a religious community. Please join me in repeating the mission statement adopted by this congregation more than 10 years ago. We choose to be a liberal religious community welcoming to all. We encourage each other on our spiritual journeys, support one another through the changes in our lives, and challenge the excesses and injustices of our time called to love and upheld by joy we live our faith and now we turn to tina schultz our director of religious education good morning everyone reverend erica and i hope you'll join us this morning this afternoon at one o'clock for a fun family worship service We'll be offering a blessing of backpacks, devices, and masks to children and youth who will return to their studies in whatever form this week. I'm a tad embarrassed to admit that I keep learning about the nifty features on my phone. I never did read the instructions. Who knew you can use it as a compass? I didn't. And that's especially helpful for someone like me who has zero repeat, zero sense of direction. Today, we will be talking about the directions by using a ritual that we usually share together in our sanctuary that honors nature-based worship and encourages us to waken our senses to the natural world around us. Many of us in this complicated time are finding our spirit homes, places of peace, and solace in the natural world. We tramp in the woods and listen to the leaves. We put our feet into the ocean. We smell flowers and watch sunsets. We meditate by meadows, pray at ponds, and are renewed and empowered with each new sunrise. In a minute, our music director, Jonathan, will lead us in our ritual you will be asked to stand or turn to each of the four directions. You need to figure out where we begin, which is the east. So think about where the sun rises in your home, or quick, go find the app on your phone. It's not that hard. Um, and now I ask Jonathan to please help us begin our ritual. Thank you, Tina. 
The seasons and the earth are turning. Tuesday is the equinox when the amount of day and night is equal. And so today we call the directions as part of our worship, remembering our dependence upon and our responsibility toward the natural world. I invite you now to turn to the east, looking towards the sun or looking at your app. I'm going to call each direction while beating on a drum. And at the end of each direction, we chant together, be with us. So now please rise in body or spirit to call the directions. Spirit of the East, Spirit of air, of morning and springtime, be with us as the sun rises. In times of beginning, times of planting, inspire us with the fresh breath of courage as we go forth into new adventures. Be with us. Please turn a quarter clockwise to the south. Spirit of the south, spirit of fire, of noontime and summer, be with us through the heat of the day and help us to be ever growing. Warm with us the strength and energy for the work that awaits us. Be with us. Now turn to the west. Spirit of the West, spirit of water, of evening and autumn, be with us at the sunsets and help us to enjoy a rich harvest. Flow through us with cooling, healing quietness and bring us peace. Be with us. Now turn to the North, spirit of the North, spirit of earth, of night time and winter be with us in the darkness in the time of gestation get a ground us in the wisdom of the changing seasons as we celebrate the spiraling journey of our lives be with us now turn back to the east goddess god of all the seasons whose presence is felt in birth and in death in the sowing of seed and in the harvest of fruit, in the turning of the earth and the moon, and in the changing of the heart and the mind. As we contemplate the matters of our lives, the things that shake us, the love that holds us, the world in all its variety, which sustained us, we ask to you, be with us. A circle is cast. We now take time in our service to turn further inward, holding on to the joys and sorrows shared here in community. We cradle those truths, knowing that all of us arrived here in this moment this morning with various worries or celebrations. I now invite you to join me in a time of prayer, followed by a minute or two of shared silence. Let us take a deep breath. And then let's take another one. Let us settle into this moment and take stock. To slow our bodies down enough to truly feel what is arising within them. As you breathe, let those emotions bubble to the surface. Perhaps what you are feeling this morning is cold. The temperature has plummeted in the last few days and it is a physical embodiment of the change that is around us. May the crispness of autumn air remind us of the balance between life and death. 
The leaves are changing colors and falling. The skies we hope are clearing. The world is turning. May we have the nimbleness to move with the season. Perhaps what you are feeling this morning is awe. The Jewish high holy days are upon us. May they be an invitation towards renewal, a chance to make amends, to acknowledge where we have fallen short and begin again. Worship is that weekly time where we reset where we are reassured that we are enough, that our imperfections do not have to define us, and that we can begin again in love. Perhaps you are feeling nervous. Schools in many districts start tomorrow and families across the state are holding a lot. Whether you are remote or in person, we pray that you might navigate all that is ahead of you. Perhaps as you breathe this morning, what you feel is grief. Many of us are holding the legacy of Justice Ruth Bader Ginsburg in our hearts. We mourn her death and may her life's work inspire all of us to work for justice, to persist, to take risks even when it feels hard to do so. Perhaps what you are feeling this morning is despair. For some gathered here, the loneliness of the pandemic feels never ending. May you know that the connections around you and between us are deep and there is nothing you can do that will disconnect you from that source of love. Perhaps, just perhaps, maybe you can feel hope this morning. Emily Towns writes that hope in the face of despair is a holy and irrational act. However improbable, even when cynicism threatens our every thought, may we be pulled forward by a hope that we co-create. Spirit of life and love, as we take yet another breath, may we feel the spirit of resilience move through us. May we know we are held. May we know we are not alone. May we enter into a time of silence together.
Every week, we take time in our service for an offering. If you are able to give, please make this a time of generosity. If that feels like a stretch, we understand. However you contribute to the work of this community, we are grateful for it. It takes all of our gifts to sustain us. This morning, as you've heard, half of the offering goes to sustain our congregation, and the other half goes to You Can Vote, a North Carolina organization focused on voter empowerment and participation. Marge Piercy is a poet and novelist and the first in her family to graduate from college. Marge Piercy grew up in working class Detroit in the midst of the depression. Her father, out of work for some time, got a job installing and repairing heavy machinery at Westinghouse. Jewish, her mother kept a kosher home. Marge Piercy says that as a child, she learned to pay sharp attention to that trouble looming, but don't let it taint your Sabbath celebration. Pay attention to trouble, but don't let it taint your Sabbath celebration. Today, I share Marge Piercy's poem, The Scent of Apple Cake. My mother cooked as drudgery, the same 15 dishes round and round like a donkey bound to a millstone grinding dust. 
my mother baked as a dance, the flour falling from the sifter in a rain of fine white pollen. The sugar was sweet snow. The dough beneath her palms was the warm flesh of a baby when they were all hers before their wills sprouted like mushrooms. Cookies she formed in rows on the baking sheets, oatmeal, molasses, lemon, chocolate chip, delights anyone could love. Love was in short supply, but pies were obedient to her command, their pastry crisp holding the sweetness within. Desserts were her reward for endless cleaning in the acid yellow cloud of Detroit, begging dollars from my father, mending, darning, bleaching. In the oven, she made sweetness where otherwise there was none. Sweetness. It is something at times, in hard times, we must bring forth. Rosh Hashanah began on Friday evening and ends tonight at sundown. Rosh Hashanah is the beginning of the 10 days that end with Yom Kippur and launch the Jewish New Year. These 10 days feature contemplation and fasting but always they begin with sweetness. A typical Rosh Hashanah greeting is for a good and sweet year, and any Rosh Hashanah gathering includes apples dipped in honey, just in case you missed the sweetness in the apple alone. If the taste of Rosh Hashanah is sweet, the sound of Rosh Hashanah is that of the shofar, a trumpet made from a ram's horn that blown calls us to attention, to renewal, as one year ends and another begins. It is not often that I find amusement in an instruction manual, but hear this. An Israeli company that ships shofars worldwide includes these instructions. The blowing technique can be learned by filling your mouth with water. Make a small opening at the right side of your mouth and blow out the water with strong pressure. Practice this again and again until you can blow the water about four feet away. Four feet. Spit water out of the side of your mouth a distance of four feet. I suggest you practice that out of doors or in the shower. Needless to say, the shofar is difficult to blow, and synagogues have to troll for brave souls who can actually pull it off. And with the blast of the shofar do during the Jewish New Year, we are supposed to wake up to who we have been in the last year and who we aim to be in the next year. Here is 30 seconds of the shofar sounded in our sanctuary last year. The Hebrew was called out by our own Andy Rubin.
wake up to who we have been in the past year and who we aim to be in the next. Before the shofar first sounded on Friday in Jewish congregations the world over, a woman took her last breath, the notorious RBG. I celebrate her determination, both quiet and fierce. I celebrate her equanimity and her wit, both cutting and playful. I celebrate her workouts, her collars, her marriage, her size. I celebrate her commitment to justice for women and for all people disenfranchised. May her memory be a revolution. The death of Ruth Bader Ginsburg came as a blow on Friday night. It adds another loss to a year that has already seen so many. The year has brought us illness, isolation, financial struggles, flood and fire and racial strife. We have seen police use excessive force, even kill, again and again. We have seen skies grow orange with fire. We wear masks and keep our distance. In times such as these, we ask ourselves, how do we carry on? How do we not have our spirits sink? Where is respite and renewal to be found? It is an old tale, a fable, a koan. A man is walking across a field when he sees a tiger. The man runs. The tiger gives chase. The man reaches the edge of a cliff. Just as he thinks the tiger will get him, he spots a vine growing over the edge of the cliff. Grabbing onto it, he swings himself over the edge to safety. The tiger comes up to the edge and snarls at the man from above. The man, clutching the vine, looks down and sees another tiger growling at him from below. Meanwhile, two mice scamper out and begin gnawing at the vine. As they chew, the man ponders his fate. For a moment, let's leave our man hanging there. A black colleague tells of her experience these last months working at a church in Brooklyn, New York the same Brooklyn RBJ grew up in. Now recall that black Americans are more than twice as likely to get COVID-19 and more than twice as likely to die of COVID-19 as white Americans. And job loss since COVID is higher for black Americans. Their savings are lower and their health insurance more scarce. Reverend Gabby Kudjo Wilkes says of her ministry, I found myself so weighed down during these months. People are buried under the pressures of life. They're buried under the weight of having to say goodbye to loved ones taken by COVID-19. They're buried under job loss and under health disparities under foreclosure and rental disputes. They're buried under the inability to homeschool their children, as well as a lack of childcare. They're buried under fear, hoping that their names aren't the next ones converted into hashtags, like Breonna Taylor, George Floyd, Ahmed Arbery, 
Jacob Blake. Then she says that she would remember. She would remember how growing up in the black church, people would say, this joy I have, the world didn't give it and the world can't take it away. This summer, I perused through the photos in a collection entitled Black Joy and Resistance. And I read a book by theologian Barbara Holmes, Joy Unspeakable, Contemplative Practices of the Black Church. Barbara Holmes says that the most powerful response to Black death and Black suffering is Black joy. How do we carry on? How do we find strength and renewal in such a time? This joy I have the world didn't give me. These words have been set to music in a modern gospel rendition. This joy the world didn't give to me and the world can't take it away. People acquainted with suffering tell us this joy is not dependent on outward circumstances joy comes from within and it rises up like an act of defiance resistance i wonder how will i how will you practice such resistance this day, this week, this lifetime? Where will you not find, but where will you seize sweetness and delight? A tiger snarls from above, and another tiger paces below. Two mice are chewing on the vine the man is holding on to. Then he sees a ripe red strawberry. Grasping the vine with one hand, he plucks the strawberry with the other. How sweet it tastes. Joy is a decision a choice, an act of defiance. Joy is something you and I must practice day in and day out to make it through the hardest of times, the grief and the loss, the uncertainty and the fearsome truths that we are now living through. We must seize moments of sweetness, of joy that the world doesn't give, and can't take away. In the breakout group, we were asked, what sweetness are you looking forward to this day? How are you practicing this joy, this resistance? You might find me practicing joy, turning up the volume, and dancing to Tina Turner in the living room. But much of the time, I engage in my act of resistance by quietly recounting the delights of the day. The rabbit I saw hopping in the grass, the sound of Joe Guthrie's laugh when she throws her head back, the sight of Aaron Kitzmiller's Cheshire cat smile, the burly man wearing a neon pink sweatshirt for breast cancer. The house painter telling me his pizza recommendation. The mushrooms are the best, he tells me. And he is right. A final tale. A little scene my colleague Jane Zepko once told. On a beach in Rockport, a stranger strikes up a conversation with a woman sitting reading in a beach chair. 
The stranger is heavy set, properly dressed, 60 ish black. They talk about this and that, and before long, the stranger wanders into a long saga about her dental history. The woman in the beach chair closes the book she is reading. She can tell she's in it for the long haul. Bridge work is what the woman says. Apparently, she had a lot of it, and it kept popping out or falling apart or getting bent or other such things that bridge work does when it goes awry. It was getting harder to follow and stay engaged, especially with a book on one's lap on a chair in the beach. But then the woman, the stranger, said, it's the snorkeling that does it. My dentist told me that I had to give it up. Then her voice changed, her face too, and she said intently, but snorkeling, it is my fondest pleasure. And with that, she stripped down to her bathing suit, put on her bathing cap, carefully fastened the strap under her chin, grabbed her snorkel and fin, and headed out. She was grinning ear to ear. What I ask you are your fondest pleasures. We may say the year is 2020, but Rosh Hashanah begins the year 5781. And that number, 5781, can remind us that humanity has suffered other plagues, famines, losses, wars, and disasters for centuries before 2020. And so too, humanity has sung and danced and stood up by the fire and laughed at the incongruity of life and wondered at its beauties. So dear ones, how might we be renewed in these hard times? Engage in an act of resistance. Take pleasure, seize joy, bake pies and cookies, molasses and lemon, make sweetness, taste strawberries, really taste them, and spit water four feet from your mouth if you can. Be delightfully defiant, and we will there find strength for this journey. Amen. And now I invite you to place your hands around yourself, a reminder of the embrace of the universe, or if you prefer and are with others, you may take their hands. And to repeat the words of our benediction after me. May faith in the spirit of life. May faith in the spirit of life. Hope 
for the community of earth. Hope for the community of earth. And love of the sacred in one another. And love of the sacred in one another. Be ours now and in all the days to come. Be ours now and in all the days to come. Go forth, called to love and upheld by joy. Amen. Amen.